Every Appalachian flood in living memory follows a map first carved by mountain building collisions 300 million years ago, long before ice, roads, or towns existed. If floodwaters seem relentless, it is because their paths are ancient, set by valleys that resisted erasure even when glaciers erased whole continents elsewhere. So why did these channels never reset? And how does this deep time blueprint still decide who gets flooded today? Roughly 300 million years ago, the heart of what is now Eastern North America experienced a continental scale collision. Africa pressed into Laurentia, compressing the crust and thickening it by more than 100 kilometers. This event, known as the Alleghenian Orogeny, forced rocks to buckle, fold, and break. The result was a landscape of long, linear ridges and deep, parallel valleys. An entire region was given a structural grain that still shapes its surface today. Crustal shortening during the Alleghenian phase created a dense network of folds and thrust faults stretching from Alabama to Newfoundland. Thick packages of sedimentary rock were bent into arches and troughs, while older, resistant basement blocks became the anchors for future valleys and ridges. These features were not subtle. In places, the crust was shortened by over 100 kilometers, leaving behind a pattern of alternating highs and lows that dictated where water could flow and where it could not. Over time, this rigid template provided the physical corridors for future drainage. Valleys formed along folds and faults, carving out linear depressions that became natural channels for runoff. The orientation and position of these lows were not random. They followed lines etched deep into the crust by ancient tectonic forces. Even as erosion wore down the mountains, the underlying structure preserved the relief, ensuring that water would continue to follow these inherited paths. The Alleghenian fabric set the stage, establishing the corridors that would channel both rivers and much later the floods that still sweep through Appalachian valleys. The New River stands as a rare example of geologic persistence in the Appalachian landscape. Flowing northward from North Carolina through Virginia into West Virginia, it slices directly across the grain of the mountains, defying the pattern of parallel ridges and valleys that dominate the region. Unlike most rivers, which follow the easier path along structural lows, the New River cuts through resistant rock, carving a gorge more than 300 meters deep into the Appalachian Plateau. Geologists have long debated the river's origin, but many agree that its course was established before the Atlantic Ocean opened 200 million years ago. Structural evidence shows that the New River occupies a corridor inherited from earlier landscapes, maintaining its general alignment as the Appalachians rose and eroded. The gorge itself records tens of millions of years of incision. Its depth, a measure of sustained uplift and relentless downcutting. Thermochronology and geomorphic mapping reveal that while the surrounding ridges and valleys shifted with each phase of tectonic activity, the new river's path endured. The present day channel is the product of this long history entrenched within Paleozoic bedrock that resisted both infilling and diversion. Today, floods surge through the same ancient gorge, their roots dictated not by recent events or human intervention, but by a template set deep in geologic time. The persistence of the New River Corridor raises a broader question. Why did such valleys, once formed, never truly heal or disappear? 
As the Appalachian Highlands rose, rivers responded with relentless downcutting, slicing deep valleys into the thick, sedimentary cover. Elevated slopes and increased stream power drove water to exploit every weakness in the crust, so folds, faults, and fracture zones became the preferred routes for incision. With each passing millennium, mass was stripped from the uplands and carried outward to distant forelands. The crust, relieved of its heavy load, flexed and rebounded upward, a process known as isostatic adjustment. This rebound acted as a counterweight to erosion, maintaining the steepness of the valleys even as the highest peaks wore down. Sediment export did not fill the valleys back in. Instead, most of the eroded material traveled far beyond the mountain belt, accumulating in foreland basins and eventually along the continental margin. The valleys themselves remained open wounds, their depths preserved by a combination of ongoing uplift and the persistent removal of debris. Beneath the folded, sedimentary layers, blocks of hard, crystalline basement rock formed invisible walls, confining the channels laterally and slowing any attempt by water to carve new paths. The result was a network of troughs that resisted infilling and lateral migration, even after the main tectonic forces faded away. This interplay between incision, mass removal, and rebound locked the valleys in place. Each new phase of erosion simply deepened the same corridors, reinforcing their position within the landscape. Over millions of years, water continued to follow these inherited depressions, reoccupying the ancient channels with every surge and flood. The mechanical legacy of uplift, incision, and rebound ensured that the Appalachian drainage network would remain remarkably stable, setting the stage for the hydrologic patterns that persist to this day. The Laurentide Ice Sheet, which once blanketed much of North America, never reached the heart of the central and southern Appalachians. Its southernmost edge stalled north of central Pennsylvania, leaving the valleys and ridges of the region inherited and untouched by glacial scouring. While glaciated areas to the north were scraped clean and reshaped, the core of the Appalachians retained its inherited topography. In places like West Virginia, Virginia, and Kentucky, the hillsides and valley floors show no trace of glacial till or outwash. Instead, deep weathering profiles and thick, chemically altered soils point to millions of years of uninterrupted surface processes. Field evidence confirms this continuity. Intact saprolite blankets, hill slopes, and ancient river gorges remain deeply incised, inconsistent with the broad, over-deepened troughs left by glaciers elsewhere. Cosmogenic nuclei dating and weathering profiles reveal stable hill slopes and river corridors that have persisted across multiple ice ages. The absence of glacial landforms, no moraines, no drumlins, no erratics, sets the Appalachian interior apart from the freshly sculpted landscapes of the north. Because the ice never advanced into these highlands, there was no wholesale regrading or valley infilling. The deep troughs and entrenched channels carved during the Paleozoic and later maintained by uplift and erosion survived the glacial cycles intact. When meltwater and post-glacial runoff surged across the continent, Appalachian rivers simply reoccupied their ancient corridors. Today's floodwaters still follow the same locked-in pathways, their roots dictated by a template that escaped the topographic reset imposed by ice elsewhere. The hydrologic legacy is clear. The valleys and floodplains of the Appalachians are not recent creations, but durable features preserved by the region's ice-free history.
flood risk in Appalachia is not evenly spread across the landscape. Instead, clusters of loss concentrate in narrow valley floors where towns, homes, and roads occupy ancestral drainage corridors. These depressions were not formed recently. They are inherited geometric corridors preserved long before settlement, infrastructure, or even recent glacial cycles. FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program data show that a small fraction of properties, often wedged between steep slopes and entrenched channels, account for a disproportionate share of insurance payouts. In some Appalachian watersheds, repetitive loss properties, those with multiple claims, make up less than 2% of the insured portfolio, but they generate more than one-fifth of total paid losses. These loss clusters are not random. They align with valley bottom communities built atop Paleozoic lowlands, places where the geometry of the land leaves little room for water to spread. Each major flood reoccupies the same inherited corridor. That process puts the same strips of real estate at risk, flood after flood. The pattern is clear in the numbers and in the lived experience of communities that sit in these ancient flood funnels. Recent advances in hydrogeologic mapping have made it possible to overlay high-resolution LIDAR data with structural fault maps and FEMA flood hazard zones. The result is a diagnostic view of risk that bridges geologic time and modern planning. In the central Appalachians, linear floodplains and repetitive loss corridors coincide with mapped Paleozoic faults and lineaments, as confirmed by USGS and state geologic surveys. When FEMA's 100-year flood zones are draped over LIDAR-derived valley axes, the alignment is not random. In eastern Kentucky and West Virginia, for example, Nearly every major floodplain follows a structural low identified in both gravity and aeromagnetic datasets. These overlays reveal that saturated valley fills and entrenched channels, features visible in borehole logs and surface mapping, are not simply local anomalies, but part of a regional pattern. For planners and hazard analysts, integrating these paleo datasets into resilience mapping is no longer optional. The data make clear that effective flood mitigation depends on reading the ancient template embedded in today's landforms. Flood risk in Appalachia does not just reflect today's storms, it is mapped by forces set in stone long before humans existed. Today, the pace of development means every planning choice must reckon with these ancient corridors. In this landscape, the past is not history. It is the blueprint for tomorrow's vulnerability. Share your thoughts below.